Hello, and welcome to EMS Research with Professor Bram, where we're here to talk about research-related issues that matter to those who work in emergency medical services. Today, we'll be talking about the traumatic experiences first responders endure. My name is Bram Duffy, and I'm a research fellow with the Institute for Social Innovation at Fielding Graduate University. As a paramedic myself with 25 years in the field, I work full-time on an ambulance doing 911 and critical care. I've also taught over 60 college-level classes in areas of communication, leadership, and EMS. My own research is in the area of how paramedics communicate. I actually have a research study open now for paramedics, so if you don't mind being interviewed by me, go to my website at professorbram.com, that's professor, B-R-A-M.com, and click on the current research tab to apply. So everything's about research here. My goal is to provide you with valuable insights that will help you, because this research information about EMS is just not always that accessible. Lots of times it's buried in other medical categories or behind a, a paid wall that's expensive. So when we can review articles that are published in academic peer-reviewed journals together and dissertations, th this series will help us be able to dive down that rabbit hole together. So if you're a physician, paramedic, nurse, firefighter, EMT, or researcher, today's video is for you. Before we get started, I wanna share that I've written two books on communication. The most recent has just been released called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can check out the link to the book below. Also, for sure, hang out till the end and I'll tell you more about it. So today we're going to be talking about how emotional distress can lead to something known as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, which is a serious condition. It, it can occur after someone has experienced a traumatic event, commonly we think, and in some cases this kind of distress can be so overwhelming that it leads to suicidal thoughts. Researchers have been trying to understand why this is happening. They've used a variety of research methods and their findings suggest that being exposed to the stressing situations repeatedly could be the main cause of PTSD and suicidal thoughts among paramedics. Most of these studies have been conducted from a purely academic perspective without including paramedics own experiences and insights. So we have to, uh, we do have to do some understanding of the issue uh, deeper, uh, and we, we have more to learn. You know, it's interesting, be because there's not a lot of um, research out there, The in this deep dive that um, paramedics are, are taking in the emotional trauma and suicidal thoughts, um, there's just uh, a, a real need to investigate further. Our understanding of the problem it just isn't as complete as it needs to be. We're missing some crucial insights, like how paramedics personally handle the scary situations they encounter daily, or how the culture is within their organizations, like the actual EMS agency or fire department that they work for, how all that affects their experiences. So it's like trying to solve a puzzle right now, but you know we're missing some pieces. And to help us think about all this, I'd like to ask you to imagine a researcher who wanted to really understand what paramedics go through. And this researcher, she didn't just want to crunch numbers. Instead, she chose a method that would let her um, be able to um, understand paramedic stories in their own words. And so this researcher's goal wasn't just to listen, though. She wanted paramedics to be an active part of the research, not just the subjects. So she worked together with them like teammates to come up with suggestions that would actually make sense in their real-life experiences. Um, the idea was to help improve things based on what they've actually lived through, not just what's written in textbooks. So I, I like to say... That, that researcher's here today. I'm in the Houston studio 
and she's in Canada coming to us from webcam. I'd like to introduce her. We have Christine Bresserford here with us today, and she goes by the name Nina, and we've met over the phone and already on that, that first name basis, so I'd like to welcome her. She's just defended her dissertation study, and as I understand, has completed all of the requirements for her doctoral degree in social sciences, uh, but just hasn't gotten the diploma in her hand physically like the paper. So it's just really exciting to have her on the show today because we're talking about research that's hot off the press. Nina attended the Royal, Roids, uh, the Royal Rhodes University in Canada, where she did her doctorate. But then before that, she got a master's degree in conflict analysis and management. I think that's really cool because I can see how all of this academic preparation feeds into the dissertation study topic. So like myself, she's a full-time paramedic, but she works in Canada for Lakeside EMS, and I'm here in Houston. I love uh, the work Nina did with her research, but I also found a strong connection to her because of our similar life path. Um, for me, we both have been paramedics for 25 years, the exact same amount of time. And she, like myself, started working as a first responder when she was a child. And it's probably because she and I, we love this stuff and found a way to be involved. I, I think... Um, you know, even though we, she and I just met, I read her work, and and the the passion in her work uh, drew me to to connect with her. And um, literally, we just met yesterday. But I have all of these um, these wonderful connected uh, feelings. And uh, people like us, maybe there's something that to say that we're special. You know, because at a young age, we're drawn to this type of work. I always tell people that I most always knew that I wanted to be a paramedic, but then I think about what happens and um, is that EMS, EMS workers that care about their patients on a deep level can open themselves, unfortunately, to mental wounds. Um, and these mental wounds can be serious. I know we're all familiar with the term PTSD, but what that means for many folks out there is that they have problems with irritability, flashbacks of the event or suicidal ideation. And I know the paramedics that are out there like us who have been in the field all of their lives, certainly like 10 years or more. And they probably, because of that exposure and time on the job, have a high percentage of a chance to end up with a PTSD diagnosis. Sometimes the treatments include counseling, but in my case, I had flashbacks and the medication therapy Fix me. I, I take prezosin. So to me personally, this is an important issue. And I know that in, in the world, it's an important issue as well. When I read your dissertation, I was blown away to find your discovery of a 2018 study by Carlton that you referred to in the study found a staggering 40% of paramedics in Canada reported that they had suicidal ideation. And then the other part was that one in 10 paramedics have reported that they've attempted suicide. So it, it's just, it, it breaks my heart to, to think and hear that. Also, you refer to a 2020 study by Backey that found paramedics were twice as likely to suffer from PTSD than soldiers. And that makes me automatically think about the support that maybe soldiers get that paramedics aren't. I'm not even sure, but it just like, wow, that's a big, that's a big difference. The currently accepted notion is that all this PTSD stuff and suicide is connected to stress and traumatic situations, but there are other uh, factors like work culture maybe to be considered. And so your study works to understand this problem and it does it by going to the paramedics directly and is, is sensitive to, uh, to a lot of things in the environment as well. Her study is called Narrative Inquiry into Emergency Medical Services, Organizational Culture and Traumatic Experiences. This used a qualitative methodology called three-dimensional narrative inquiry, where stories were analyzed and um, they worked to understand how paramedics construct their experiences of the traumatic situations, you know, and, and it's because this stuff is context dependent and it's highly subjective and it's situated in time. So these are, um, there are many 
things that feel arbitrary and, and difficult to lock down and be precise when defining and understanding this, these experiences. And so all of this sits at an intersection. I know we say that word in, in academics, but it just connects well. <laughs> we, this is really at an intersection of communication and perception and, and the lived experiences which are dramatically different for everyone. And so um, as a result, these issues are really difficult to investigate. And Nina, I'm so glad that you're here to talk to us about your investigation. And to start us out, can, can you tell us about this? Many people may not be familiar with this type of research. So can you tell us about, in layman's terms, what is the three-dimensional narrative inquiry, that, that this method that you used? For sure, and thank you very much for that wonderful introduction um, and for having me here today. Um, so narrative inquiry is a qualitative research methodology that uses stories as data. You've already mentioned that. So instead of collecting survey data or Likert scale data or statistics and figures, narrative inquiry, um, narrative inquirers gather stories and then analyze those stories in different ways. So some narrative inquiries use a thematic analysis process, for example, and they identify common themes. But three-dimensional narrative inquirers use the three-dimensional narrative inquiry framework to help them understand the stories that they have gathered. So the three-dimensional nar narrative inquiry is rooted within Dewey's philosophical views of experience. So Dewey described experience as continuous, interactive, and situated. Engaging in three-dimensional dim narrative inquiry so requires the inquirer to think within three dimensions. The dimensions are the personal and social along one side, the past, present, and future um, on the other, and then the place or the situation would be the third dimension. So three-dimensional narrative inquirers pay attention to the intersection of the self, social world, time, and place and use those intersections within the three-dimensional space to generate understanding of experience. So I know this all seems really abstract, and it took me a long time, probably close to two years, to really wrap my head around it. What's really great, though, is that I don't know what other method would be able to get at the gist of what your study is trying to do. So it's it, it, it's a methodology that connects really well, and I... I don't know how often it's used because I, I'm familiar with narrative inquiry, but then the three-dimensional you know, aspects of being able to, um, to basically um, map out you know, this, um, these, these situations. And um, I, uh, I know that you brought one of the stories uh, with you to read today. I'd, I'd love to, uh, to hear about it. And, of course, these are... Um, these are graphic uh, moments, you know, for the, the person and the, the experience is a big um, traumatic deal. So I just want to caution those who may have children in the room to know that, that, um, that um, we're talking about a sensitive topic. But uh, in, in these stories, would, would, you, um, would you share? Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned it because the story that I'm about to talk about or to tell you, um, could be considered triggering or distressing by some. So I uh, do advise uh, listener discretion at this point. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of Jack's stories, uh, and I'll, I'll read him. It was transcribed uh, verbatim. So he says that the first for me that I really struggled with was, it wasn't the first person who died in front of me, but it was the first person who I felt I had a personal connection with that died in front of me. And it was just an old lady in a care home who I'd never met before. But what she did was when we loaded her into the ambulance, she grabbed my hand and she wanted to hold my hand. And she kind of caught me off guard because I knew she was very, very sick. And I had a lot of what I thought I had a lot of work to do. So in hindsight, I only got to spend about 60 seconds with her alive. So nothing that I was going to do was going to make a difference. But she grabbed my hand and she looked into my eyes. She was unable to speak, she was so short of breath, but she just wanted to look into my eyes and hold my hand. And then she took her other hand and grabbed my wrist above the hand that she was holding. And so she was really just trying to have a personal moment with me for, you know, through the fear and all these other things. And I wound up coaching her like, yeah, I just wound up 
trying to de-escalate her emotionally and to tell her that she's safe, she's not alone, I'm with her, things like that. And so that was probably one of the most impactful, not the most impactful, but that was the first impactful call that I really remember. I was very, very new at the time, maybe two or three years into the business, and I was working with a seasoned veteran paramedic of probably 20 years. And she gave me a lot of trouble for the way that I behaved on that call, saying that it was inappropriate. I had work to do, and I should have been going for an IV. I should have been setting up for a code. I should have put the pads on her. I had a bunch of work that I should be doing. Rather than talking, rather than taking what was literally 30 seconds while she took her last few breaths, and I just spent some emotional time with her. You know, so many times uh, people may make the assumption that these these things that change paramedics' lives, these these moments that we share with other people, so many times people assume that you know, um, the, the incident is like the most crazy, horrible thing imaginable. Like, I don't know, someone's head blowing up or, you know, in front of you, I don't know something. I'm just trying to be like as dramatic as possible, but it's not, it, it, it may be not that because it's, it's what touches our, touches us personally. And, and, um, I, I think that, um, when you have uh, someone that bears their soul to to you to this to this degree and shares, you know, about their nightmares, it makes me wonder. You know, you, you have all of this this data now. You know, all of these these stories. How how did you begin to figure out? You know, how to make something meaningful of those? Yeah, and that took a significant amount of time. Was figuring out how to align the stories. Um, how to hold the stories of the participants and myself in relation to each other within the three-dimensional narrative inquiry space. Um, and then by paying attention to where they intersected with each other and with the three dimensions of time, sociality, and place. And I think um, kind of the best way to explain it would be by reading another excerpt from my dissertation. Uh, in my dissertation, I say that uh, during the interview, as I listened to Jack speak, I was reminded that many of the events which stay with paramedics are not the ones that might be considered a traumatic by those outside of the industry. What I mean by this is that often trauma is associated with blood, guts, gore, violence, and serious physical injury. I've been told many times by members of the public that they could never be paramedics because of the traumatic injuries that paramedics see, because they couldn't deal with all the blood. But it's often not the blood that bothers paramedics but the human suffering which we connect to our own lives. Throughout my dissertation, I tell my own story of a young girl who was a passenger in a vehicle involved in a motor vehicle collision. The girl was trapped in the car and had sustained serious graphic physical injuries, but it was not the injuries that bothered me, but the connection I made to my son and my feelings of helplessness and perceived loss of control. For Jack, it was his partner's feedback on how he had managed this patient that left him feeling like he had not lived up to the cultural expectations of what a paramedic should do in this type of situation. He said, yeah, it was as if I'd failed that call because I don't know, she had expectations for me, I guess, and I didn't meet them. Yeah, her feedback to me was like I had failed that call because I should have been clinically attending to the patient, not emotionally depending or attending to the patient. He continued on by saying, I think her criticism really impacted me because when I reflected on my education and training, I really wasn't trained or educated and obviously not culturally supported for the way I behaved on that, for the way I treated my patient. I'm not going to say behaved for the way I treated my patient on that call. I was not trained for that. I was never, that's not a competency shall we say for paramedics. You know, in that station especially, it certainly wasn't culturally supported. And so her criticism of me, and then when I reflected on what I should have been, what I should have been doing, it kind of made sense that I had done something wrong on that call because I was never taught to do that. I just did it because it felt natural. So reflecting on my own time spent in paramedic school, 
I realized that I received countless hours of training on how a situation described by Jack should have been handled clinically. I can mentally picture the different algorithms and treatment protocols, step-by-step, skill-by-skill, medication-by-medication, and I'm sure you can too. I also did not receive any training on how the situation could have been or should have been handled emotion- emotionally. How does one emotionally support a person in their final moments of life? I was never taught what to say to a person who was taking their final breaths. Were you? Paramedics learn to measure success by the skills they have successfully completed or by the kinds of medications that they have been able to administer to their patients. The more difficult the skill, for example, a crike, or the more obscure and rarely administered a medication, the more revered paramedics become. Holding the hand of an old woman who is taking her final breaths and comforting her in her final moments of life is not considered a coveted achievement within EMS culture. I couldn't help but wonder how I would have responded if I was placed in this situation. Looking back, I realized that at one point, I was so emotionally repressed that I would have lacked the ability to empathize with this patient. I would have avoided any situation which required empathetic or sympathetic response. Focusing on clinical treatments such as starting IVs, connecting the patient to the cardiac monitor, and preparing to capture their airway should they stop breathing certainly takes the focus away from any emotional involvement and places is places it on the completion of tasks. For Jack, the lack of education, lack of cultural support, and negative feedback from his partner had a dramatic effect. He said, I think there's two ways that it really impacted me. One, I was shut off emotionally. I refused to allow myself to have an emotional connection with any with any patient. Okay, that was one way. The other way that it impacted me was when I walked away from that, blaming that person's death on my lack of clinical treatment, which in hindsight is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, there was absolutely nothing that I could have done. Knowing now what I know for clinical picture, but that was really the two ways. It detached me more so emotionally from my patients than ever before. And I carried the blame and guilt about her death. And then in addition to that, I absolutely refused to let a patient ever touch my hand or hold my hand because I had a big psychological reaction to patients holding my hands because it would send me back to that time where in my mind, I had killed that woman. Jack would secretly carry this blame and guilt uh, of this experience with him for more than six years. Wow. So it was six years before he told you the story? It was six years before he saw, before other events um, led him to finally receive the psychological help that he needed. Yeah. You know, I have so many thoughts about that story because there's, there's a lot of what ifs and one of the, some of the what ifs involved this in my mind. One is that that partner that was with him maybe was trying to protect him and knew that if you get that, if you get that personal with your patients, it's going to hurt you, you know, and maybe, maybe not. But I, I think that I've spent my career with the focus on being able to pull both things off, be able to be there for my patient and also be able to um, do the interventions. And I, I don't know about you, but I've recognized that there are providers that do a better job of connecting with their patients as people versus uh, walk in with the goal of figuring out uh, what tasks have to be completed, you know, and, you know, and I know that sometimes it's referred to as um, being a nurse versus being a paramedic and, you know, um, but I personally think that it's all connected. And I think that uh, if, if you can help your patient feel better, then, um, then it's going to help lower their blood pressure. It's going to help them relax. It's going to help them with the whole situation all the way through. And so, um, that's my takeaway is that gosh some folks are just task oriented and other people you know try to connect more and and so what um, tell me more about how this influenced your own thinking about how you do your job as a paramedic well so as a para- paramedic practitioner i think i've become more reflective and introspective and i'm more emotionally intelligent 
I've started to process and understand my feelings instead of suppressing and compartmentalizing them. And using my knowledge of EMS culture and traumatic experience to help me understand what's going on inside my head. But that's um, sometimes a lot easier said than done. Um, but I think the bulk of my growth has been as a leader by understanding the significant role that we leaders play when it comes to the mental, um, mental health and welfare of our crews. And also the role we play in maintaining positive staff morale and creating a supportive organizational culture. Um, checking in with the crew and taking 10 minutes to have a talk with them after they've come off a nasty call or after several consecutive calls that might have drained them is so important. Um, even if they don't choose to talk about the call at all, just talk to them about the weather, talk to them about their dog or their cat, or talk to them about something that is currently important in their lives. Um, but be present, be there, be genuine, and show them that you care and that you have their backs should it become required. And make sure that they understand that they're under no obligation to talk to you. Um, but if something is bothering them, they might not feel comfortable talking to their supervisor and boss or boss, and that's perfectly understandable. But let them know that um, you can connect them to help if they need it. And it's really not a whole lot more complicated than that. So how does organizational culture influence these traumatic experiences that, that may cause PTSD? Yeah, so there's, there's many different influences and it's like an onion. There are different layers and at different levels too. Um, but organizational culture influences the way paramedics navigate their feelings and emotions wow. following traumatic situations. Organizational culture influence partner relationships, which can significantly affect the way that uh, paramedics experience trauma. Organizational culture normalizes psychological injuries and PTSDs and the behaviors that are associated with them. Organizational culture, incus uh, organizational culture encourages the use of certain coping mechanisms following traumatic events, and often those are avoidance coping, but they also include storytelling and the, the use of black humor. Yeah. And so when you say black humor, we mean not as a African-American or a, a racial black. We mean dark humor, right? Correct. Like evil Correct. humor. Correct. It is dark <laughs> humor, and it's also known as gallows humor or mm -hmm. grotesque humor. But ultimately, it makes fun of the misfortunes of others. Um, but I find that as paramedics, we either laugh about it or we cry about it. Um, and so there is a fairly deep dive done into the use of dark humor within the dissertation. Um, and some of the participants actually do state that they don't find it a, a positive coping technique and that, that it is, associ is associated with guilt afterwards. Organizational culture also influences our identity as paramedics. It teaches us that paramedics are who we are and not just what we do. Um, organizational culture encourages the need to be in control and that need to be in control often spills out into other areas of life, making it difficult for us to have relationships. Um, and um, we also know that organizational culture currently in Alberta or in Canada is changing. Um, and that was precipitated by uh, the suicide of a paramedic who took his own life while he was on shift back in 2015, which kind of blew the top off of what was really going on behind the scenes and allowed paramedics to talk, start talking about what they were feeling and experiencing. Yeah, those unbelievable statistics. And I don't know uh, what the statistics are in other countries, but uh, I know that this is uh, something that is... Uh, human problem it's and yeah. uh, it's it's really thank you so much for addressing this you know i know what it's like to do a dissertation and you have um you've done a, an, an amazing job i was really um, impressed with this with this body of work so what's next for you what do you see yourself doing next <laughs> well i think i'm going to take over the world thank you no, but seriously, it is a good question. And I haven't quite graduated yet, so I'm hoping for that to, hope to happen first. But definitely expanding the research, um, possibly to a larger population to make it more generalizable. Um, the other thing that I'm very interested in understanding is how do paramedics have a successful career without mental health issues? 
and what sets those paramedics apart from the participants in this story. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see what comes up next. Well, I hear you. And so if people want to connect with you personally, do you, um, do you have a, um, an email address or something you'd like to share if, if someone, if one of our viewers uh, wants to make a, a research connection with you? Absolutely. So it's nina.beresford at royalroads.ca. And so N-I-N-A and then Beresford is spelled B-E-R-E-S-F-O-R-D. Thank you again so much for being here. This is super awesome. I'm um, thankful to have you all the way from Canada to, to Houston today. And um, so uh, great interview, great time. I also want to invite you to check out my latest book. The book was already rated as Amazon's newest number one release in emergency medicine category, which blew my mind. I co-authored the book with Four Arrows, who has two doctorates and is an expert on indigenous scholarship and hypnosis. So I want to invite you to check it out because we introduce a method for communicating with patients on the scene of the emergency that takes advantage of some of the properties found in hypnosis. This book works to change the way we approach and interact with the emergency patient that's in acute distress and will help you be a better practitioner. The book is called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can follow the link below to find it or go to almost anywhere where books are sold to find it. You can contact me with proof of your order, uh, like a screenshot or something, and I'd be happy to mail you an autographed sticker that would be designed to stick inside the jacket cover. I'm doing a research project related to paramedics who live in the United States, and I could use your help. So if you don't mind being interviewed over a video call, go ahead and head to my website and fill out the form at professorbram.com. That's professorbram.com. Thank you again for listening, and I look forward to sharing more insights with you in this next episode. If you enjoyed EMS research, please tell your friends and like, share, subscribe, just to help others get the message.